how's it going everybody welcome back to the arcane archive uh <laughs> we've got uh we got another rousing round of cautionary chronicles for you today you know so so very stimulating so very just encouraging for you I'm know so excited Oh, I actually am. Can't you tell, Sammy? I'm yeah, super excited. I'm just ecstatic really... for all the amazing examples we have for, you know, why humanity should continue to exist, right? Because that's that's what we always are looking for. Reasons to exist, you know, our lives having meaning. Uh, but it's fine. It's fine. We're good here. Because you know why? It's going to be great. Everybody here, you know, there's there's things we can get lessons to be learned education to be had and we're gonna we're gonna be here with you guys to help uh you know deliver it to everyone and and hopefully try to make the world a better happier brighter place uh but yeah you know before we get into that though uh, go ahead and do please be sure to like and comment down below in the video about your thoughts on you know any tales and stories that we talk about kind of what you think of all that's going on here uh of course subscribe and share the channel if you haven't mm -hmm. already we are we appreciate it immensely it's uh we primarily rely upon word of mouth for kind of the you know video uh the the channel to kind of spread and get more attention so any amount of support you can offer in that regard is immensely appreciated as always um but with that let's let's go ahead let's 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 get this train wreck over with <laughs> All right, here we go. First tale of the day uh, is titled A Tale of Two Sessions or Why the Relationships at the Table Trump Everything by Sad DM 64 This is a throwaway account, so sorry if this ends up a bit long. TLDR, one group gets their player agency massively shut down by my boss encounter, yet still finds a way to have a great time. Uh, on the other hand, a player in another group completely wipes the floor with my boss encounter, but brings down the whole vibe of the table because it didn't go even better for them. Now, I don't know if this is the worst horror story ever, but I felt a need to tell someone. This is my therapy. I understand you, OP. It's all right. We're here for you. So I'm a forever GM. I run several campaigns regularly, as well as running irregular one shots and games in various systems. I take it quite seriously, as I think of myself as putting a lot of thought and effort into my GMing. I try to make games fun, and that involves looking up advice and tips on the internet, checking out first and third party modules and homebrewing stuff, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. All in an effort to create an experience that, well, I think will be fun for the particular players that I am hosting. But, man! Two recent contrasting experiences have reminded me of something that's always been true, but easy to forget. You can do all the work in the world, but if the people at the table do not mesh, you will not have fun. Example one, boss from hell. The first session I talk about, or I want to talk about, was a boss fight that I ran for my oldest D&D group. We've been playing for years and we're all friends away from the table. Same characters from level one all the way up to 16. Love it. Love everything about that. That's great. I personally, though, I just hope it didn't take 16 years to do, maybe personally, but that's just my preference. Uh, the party went to hell to fight an archdevil boss. It was a high level encounter, and the boss had some pretty big powers, including a mass charm power. At an Ooh. important point, he deployed it charming all of the frontliners which was essentially three-fifths of the party it was a save ends effect but through terrible terrible luck none of the characters managed to break the charm for the rest of the entire battle even with the bard granting advantage with counter charm that is crazy Effects that <laughs> shut down players are a much discussed topic in the discourse, and I won't debate the pros and cons of them here. But suffice to say, it probably wasn't the way the players envisioned the battle going. If a few factors had been different, I could very well see this session ending up on this sub from a player's perspective. But the thing is, our group at this point have so much mutual trust built up over the years of play. I trust them implicitly to buy into the story, to not make disruptive characters slash decisions, etc. And they trust that I am trying to create interesting challenges for them and not just trying to win by beating them into submission. 
We all know that at the end of the day, we're just trying to have fun together. So even though the battle had ground to a halt for more than half of the team, they made it so much fun and so very memorable. The artificer was like, well, I'm fixing my robot. You guys enjoy the rest and just peaced out and used mending on his companion every round. The barbarian made a funny comment about how this must truly be hell because hell for a barbarian is not fighting. And when an uncharmed character attacked the boss, Barb would admonish them and give an aside about how the archdevil seemed like a misunderstood guy. It was funny. The heroes did end up winning in the end. And, you know, I won't bore you with the particulars of my campaign's plot, but suffice to say the day was saved and a family was reunited. The Barbarians player even congratulated me afterwards for how touching the story was. I didn't feel stressed or like a failure because of how the battle went. The moral isn't that player agency doesn't matter or that you shouldn't think carefully about how certain effects might be anti-fun, but I am saying that the difference between a good and bad session can just as often be a function of the relationships between the people at the table rather than anything to do with the game itself. Beautifully put. Honestly, can't say I could say it any better than that. 100% agree. Uh, in contrast, OP continues, example number two, power creep. There's another group I have fun or I, I have run for regularly. I have run for regularly, excuse me, my fault, for years. There's a player in this game. Let's call him Soups. His character is a martial frontliner heavily themed around being a superhero. So I recently ran a boss encounter for them, too, and against a group of cultists, no less. Here's one way to describe how it went. While, fra while the framing is slanted, of course, all of the following statements are factual. Soups took the center stage as usual. He stood between danger and his friends. He smashed many minions to death. He closed in on the boss and battered him until he turned tail and fled. When they chased the boss down, Soups scored the final strike that defeated him. All of the remaining minions surrendered to Soups in particular, with all eyes on him. Soups successfully persuaded the entire cult to abandon their evil ways. The other characters also contributed, but struggled in various ways. The ranger missed every single shot through some god-awful luck. Damn, you hate to see it, bro. That sucks. The paladin and the fighter both got KO'd at different times and got down to two death saving throws each. Luckily, Soups was there to heal them and save their lives. Sounds like a pretty great session for Soups, no? Well, not if you ask the player. He was quite obviously irritated, swearing, and for the entire fight, every single time didn't, something didn't go perfectly for him, would pout and rage. He was mad when his he was mad when his initiative roll was low. He was mad when he missed an attack. He was mad when he got hit by an attack or when he hit an attack, but it didn't do enough damage for him. He was mad when the boss damaged him too much, even though, as previously mentioned, he was nowhere near the most threatened character and was never knocked out at any time. He was mad when an enemy imposed a status effect on him. He was mad when a house rule, that you can use a, bon a potion as a bonus action, finally benefited an enemy, even though over 50 plus sessions it has benefited the players much, much more. He was real mad when the boss ran away because it meant a slight delay in finishing the fight. But most of all, he was really mad at me if I forgot about even the slightest something, such as a status effect on a boss, or and even if I made corrections immediately, he still would just rage. I'm human. I forget things, and I always will. The difference is trust. If we trust each other that neither of us are trying to cheat, you can correct me without fear and I will fix the problem and we can then move on. But if you don't trust me, every mistake I make is going to look like a deliberate attack. And the saddest part for me is I tried. There's two sides to every story. I'm sure if you ask Soups, he could tell you where I'm lacking as a GM. I'm human. I'm sure I could maybe do better. Maybe his past DMs would put me to shame. I don't know. But what I can say is, objectively, I have personally put more thought into involving soups in the campaign than I have for the vast majority of my other players. I've made superhero-themed side quests. I've mined characters from his backstory. I've homebrewed superpowers for him to acquire. I've made sure his character is a symbol of hope for the fawning masses of NPCs everywhere he goes. But none of that matters if an enemy scores a critical hit on him. Or, God forbid, he loses one turn. One. 
to a status effect. Well, if you've made it this far, friends, thanks for powering through my breakdown. If you have players, friends, who you can consistently have fun role-playing with in a stupid make-believe game, hold them close and don't take them for granted because there's few things better in this world. End post. Again, I must say, OP, if you ever see this video, just beautifully, beautifully put, beautifully written all around. I understand. I, I can just feel all of your emotion you put into this, both the good and the bad, the rage, the triumph, all of it. Like, honestly, amazing job. Well done. Uh, I think that this particular story is a amazing Paragon example of, of a lot of the issues, but also the, the gifts and the benefits of tabletop role-playing games is that, you know, he's absolutely right. You know, this, this example, the first example where, you know, he, he had a boss encounter, high level boss. This is an arch devil from the hells. You know, this guy is absolutely going to have probably some bogus bullshit abilities here or there but your party hopefully again if they're level 16 they're also they also have plenty of bogus bullshit abilities by that point too and while yeah i'm sure a lot of people it's probably not maybe the most fun right away to be like oh he just gets the ability to mass charm you know uh, your player character it's just another thing to avoid that's just part of the strategy and, and there are, there are other ways of i would at least hope there are ways of shutting it off or taking it off of them if it's a mass charming ability you know if you have certain characters like if you have a monk monks at a high enough level can just turn that off they can just shut that shit down although i think with the new rules that actually may have changed now but uh Maybe not depending, maybe it's just higher level. Either way, if you have, you know, certain things that might dispel or get rid of charming effects or whatever. Like there are many ways of counteracting this aside from just, you know, making the save. Uh, I mean, it could also be like, for instance, because he does say it was a save ends effect. Like, so basically I assume every round after that, you could make a save to break the charm and they just kept failing. And that's, that's sometimes just how the luck the roles go. Believe me, I get it. It can be if 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 you were to only focus on one aspect, like OPS said, this could absolutely turn into being like a horror story in and of itself. But luckily, the players took this and they just ran with it. They they turned it into something amazing. We're like, you know, you can absolutely have those moments if you're charmed by an enemy. I don't know if there are other ads or if there are other like minions in the room, but like they could still attack the minions. They just can't necessarily attack uh, the arch devil. Like they could do other things though. They can still help their friends. For instance, if they have abilities to like heal them or even protect them, like they can still protect their friends and do other things. And I love the fact that it was clear that, you know, the players understood how charm works. They didn't attack their friends. They didn't, not do anything like you you can do things here um as a matter of fact it seems like there is a uh <laughs> there is a, a comment down below that does it highlight this exact thing where he's just like uh commenter says when players remember charmed does not equal mind control uh and then the op of the story literally responds saying is low key how a player responds to being charmed is one of the best litmus tests for how great a player they're going to be there's the throw my hands up, guess I can't do anything now, player. And then there's a player who tries to find every single loophole to act exactly the same as they normally would, such as, okay, but is tying them up so the fighter can destroy them next turn really harmful, though? And then there's the absolute Chad. Oh, the vampire charm me for a day? Awesome. Gives me time to write some sappy poetry about my new goth boyfriend. You know, like, <laughs> there are plenty of ways around charm there are plenty of things to understand that charm does not equate to mind control that's dominate you know person or monster where that can come into effect but charm in and of itself does not mean that they get you get to just do anything you want or to that character they have to listen to everything that you say and do uh what do you think sammy what do you think about this whole story here? no i i mean i love how it went the first the first um example of the boss as much as i'd be annoyed of with a mass charm, uh, if you're at that point in a game, you're level 16, things can get that kind of... I mean, sure, uh, you know, I like, mean... This... It's going to be, you know, some savers... It's going to be some fucking savers suck, some 
some rough goes, um, which is I fine. Mean, I mean, it also sounds of... like they just continuously failed the save. Like every yeah. every turn, like, you know, and it's like, yeah. I, I mean, mean there's, anything, there's nothing wrong with that intrinsically. Um, if anything, I feel like a lot of high-level play, the reason high-level play gets boring is when you start to just, either everything gets so big. Everything. Yeah, either you yeah. obliterate everything or everything gets so big you can't even keep track of it. But there's yeah. a middle ground to that. And I think, you know, I mean, that kind of like the the way that they're handling it of like, well, you know, I can't do what I wanted to do, but charm doesn't mean I'm going to hurt my best friend either. Yeah. So, I mean, like I've I'm a huge fan of high level play myself. I prefer it because it gives obviously it gives you a ton of options for all the cool things that you can do and be like, you know, ironically, uh uh, uh, kind of like the the second uh, story that OP says, like kind of like a superhero in terms of just like all the dope shit you can do. And you can fight, but then you can also fight things like this. You can fight the baddest, most powerful creatures and entities who can also do all kinds of crazy, amazing shit. Like, I feel like you can really make it super anime-esque in that regard. Yeah. Um, but it obviously does require a very attentive and specific implementation. And you have to, you do have to have the wherewithal and the awareness to remember all the things you can do because at that level you can do a lot of shit especially oh, if yeah. you're a spellcaster and you have all the kinds of other stuff like you, you can do a lot of stuff so i i understand why for a lot of people it can be overwhelming and that it can be a bit of a a difficult messy you know cluster f of of shit to have to remember and deal with and and manage and all the other stuff but i i'm like yo if you can run if you have a, if you have the right crew, if you have if you can all run, and that's also where I believe too. And GMs delegate to your players a bit, right? If you're in any kind of encounter where you're maybe you know running a lot of NPCs or characters, give some of it to your players to do. Like they would love that for the most part. Maybe not everybody, but I'm sure you probably have at least one or two players in your party that would love and be totally cool with supporting and helping and you know, rolling some dice or or like knowing some abilities that some of these uh, NPCs or whatever can do, you know? Yeah. It can be a fun way to still include your players so that they're not just, you know, sitting there for 30 minutes, you know, waiting for all of the NPCs and everyone else to go for their turn to come back up. It can keep them engaged. Um, but for this, for the second story here, again, great example showcases how everything essentially overall went pretty perfect for this player right power creep and yet just because it didn't go perfectly for him just because he had the slightest bit of of obstacle of adversity of whatever he still constantly had an issue he couldn't enjoy even all of his triumphs even though he was clearly shining and apparently the gm even to a point where I feel like this is probably problematic a bit, where the GM seems too kind of treat him like the main character and that more than any of his other players in this group, maybe in any group that he's a part of, he deliberately like involves soups, like backstory, back characters, his personal, his personal themed kind of side quest. He homebrews superpowers and abilities for him. Like does all this stuff literally caters to him nonstop. And yet this player has no ability to appreciate all of the things that he does have and only ever seems to focus on the shit that he doesn't or even the slightest negative thing that might happen. And that, that again, in essence, really just shows to you, hell, not just with tabletop RPGs, but with life in general, right? Like, yeah, you got to be able to appreciate what you do have. Now, of course, you know, it's important to be able to acknowledge the bad things because they help you to have perspective and awareness to maybe hope someday, hopefully fix the more negative things, right? To make them better or make them positive, or even by seeing the negative things, that is indeed what can give us the ability to appreciate the positive things all the more, right? By comparison. But when you start to focus too much on all the negative stuff, all you're gonna do is just end up ruining everything you have. And you'll you'll miss the positive things. And at that point, it's like, <laughs> why... Why are you even playing the game at all? You know, why, why, why are you doing this shit at all? If, if all you're going to do is just focus on the negative and feel like you're just suffering all the time with nothing, you know? Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit cringy to go through all of that and then be basically just complain about it. 
it's uh it's unfortunate <laughs> you get but, you know, everything you want and it I doesn't think, go your way yeah out. you know and that's that again it's like you can like again it's it's a great example of gm you know did seemingly just about just about everything right you know prepped did all this stuff did everything right and yet still this person decided to find the problems and and not just find but to focus and stay on the problems and issues instead of focusing on the amazing triumphs and positives um but i do believe unless you have any other kind of comments or thoughts on this one sammy all right, then. I do believe that we, that's about all we got for that. Let's move on to the next story of the day. Samuel, take it away. Yeah, I got player cripples his own character and then blames the DM. Uh, several months back, some friends and I started a weekly D&D night. It consisted of me, DM, two other longtime friends, and the problem player, Warlock, who was the roommate of the friend who was hosting. This was the Warlock's first time playing D&D. He was nice enough, but was also somewhat stubborn and did not want to take anyone's advice when creating his character. For example, he wanted to, he said he wanted to be an all-purpose caster, whatever that means, and decided to pick a Warlock. DM told him rightly that if he wanted a more diverse form of caster, he should consider a sorcerer or a wizard because Warlocks typically end up spamming Eldritch Blasts for most of the game. He ignored the DM's advice and took... Uh, warlock anyway um that's not too big yeah that's not too big of a deal but here's where warlock committed seppuku (laughs) he had given himself an eight in constitution naturally when the dm saw that he was using constitution as a dump stat he very strongly recommended that he change that warlock however was not having it his argument was that he was going to be on the back lines all the time so he did not need a lot of hp while we all kept telling him that an aid in Constitution was a delayed death sentence to his character, but he refused to hear it. <laughs> we eventually just said screw it and decided to let him learn the hard way. The first few levels, he was just barely surviving, almost dying four separate times. So it was obvious his character was on borrowed time. Fast forward a few months and we are level four on Dr- Dragon of Icepire Peak. They were like only dis- level three? Or four. Well, now they're level four. Is it fast forward a few months? No, they probably they probably four. started at level one. Yeah, that's just that's. Oh Who knows how god. many sessions they actually played? It's, oh you know. my god! Warlock at this point had a maximum of fifteen hit points, small enough for something like a dragon to one shot him. <laughs> During Dragon of Ice Bar Peak, whenever the party long rests or travels, the DM rolls a d twenty to determine what location the dragon is at. Our bad luck. Uh, it spots us on our way to Butter's Call Ranch and combat starts. Further bad luck on initiative, and Cryovane went first. Bad for us because he was able to hit three of us with his ice breath, ice breath 10d8. It, it, all in all, it came out to 52 damage if he failed to save, which isn't even a high roll for that. Which Warlock no. did so. I mean, no, which, it's, it's a bit above average, to be fair. Like, it, it is a bit yeah, above average or around average. So it's like, it's that's still decent. That's a good, that's a good roll. Yeah, but he can't do 52 damage if he failed to save, which Warlock did. So he was dead. Not unconscious, dead. Yeah! And he did enough damage to bypass bypass his death saves. Even even if he had saved, he might have still been gone, potentially. Like No, I think he had just enough to avoid death. Yeah, that's true. If it was 52, then yeah, he would have had just enough because it would have been 26 damage. He would, need, he would need like 30. Yeah, 30, 30 at least. But yeah, but so yeah, if he failed, he's, he's just done. He's, he's just done. So... It's at this point that Warlock was turning visibly red. For a second, I was extremely uncomfortable because I thought he was going to start crying. (laughs) Instead, he just sat there staring daggers at the DM like he just threatened his mother. The (laughs) DM could not have failed to notice and seemed to sense a tantrum coming. He tried to cut out ahead of it and started saying how it's no big deal and he can just make a new character since they were very low level. He was very kind about it and never once said, I told you so. That is until Warlock blew up and started accusing the DM of targeting him. To his further credit, our DM just silently sat there as calm as can be while Warlock said he was a terrible DM and how the DMs he watches on YouTube are so much better and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, After yeah, yeah. the Warlock finally wore himself out, the DM looked him dead in the eye and very calmly reminded him that the entire table, including the other new player, had warned him from the very beginning that an eight in con was a death sentence. I wish I could tell you he flipped the table before storming out, but what he didn't set instead was so much more cringe. He did storm out of the room, but he went upstairs to his room instead. Moments later, we start hearing him blasting death metal out of his speakers at full volume, as if he was the king of edgelords. We tried to ignore it for about 30 minutes, but it was making the game very difficult to play. Eventually, his roommate went upstairs to reason with him. The only response he got was a thud when the warlock threw something at the door. 
We decided to just call it a night and hold the game night at someone else's apartment next time. Needless to say, Warlock is not going to return. <laughs> In the DM's words, even if he apologizes, there is no place for that kind of toxicity at our table. Incredible to me how a 25-year-old man is capable of behaving like a child who did not get his way even after we warned him about the outcome from day one. <laughs> oh, you know, it's unfortunate how it's like incredible to people still that a 25-year-old is capable of behaving like a child when it's, I mean, hell, man, we've seen, what, 50, 60, 70-year-olds still acting like they're children. Like, it's it's... It just it, again, it's a clear sign that just because you grow older, unfortunately, doesn't mean you really mature, which is unfortunate. Um, <laughs> yeah, this guy, I, I, okay, you know, here's the thing: if you want to put Khan as a dump stat, personally, I never really see any reason to do it myself. Like, you know, maybe you're trying to do a, a meme character, or you're trying to have a theme or something. I don't know. I still feel like it's just doesn't make any real sense if you if you're expecting or wanting to have this character for a long period of time it just doesn't make any sense if you don't care about that though if it really is like a meme character where you're just like yeah this character's gonna die soon you know you just you're just doing it for the lulls or something it's like okay sure i can see it personally i still feel like unless it's a one shot it, that that's kind of annoying it doesn't make sense because you usually get the best experiences out of ttrpgs when your characters last for a while you get to be able to like yeah explore their story they be begin to make you know more lasting connections and relationships with the other player characters at the table and like npcs and so it's like i just don't ever see a reason why you would possibly dump constitutional well, which is it's, literally it's your health it's funny i i agree but I'm, I'm looking at the comments and there's some stuff. I'm doing some mental math here. If someone with a better handle on the system wants to pipe up, be my guest. If I'm not mistaken, innate in Constitution is a penalty of 1 HP per level. At 4th level, that means he's down 4 HP from the default, which would be 19. Let's say he had taken a middling Constitution score, which gave him a plus 1 instead, not unreasonable for a caster class. So he would be up 4 more HP and would have had 23 max HP instead. That dragon still would have one-shot him even I, in that scenario. I was going to say. Even the damage you described, so I don't actually know how much of an I told you so scenario this is. Yes, his juvenile tantrum at the end is shameful one way or the other, but I don't know what I, what I that I buy the premise that a level 4 spellcaster should have expected to weather 52 points of damage in a single attack at the beginning of combat. And and you know what? I I'm seeing people saying you should always at least have 14 con as a caster. I agree, but yeah, a hundred percent. Um, th that's just a difficult encounter. I mean, to be fair, it really like, is like because that could have like, killed anyone if they didn't save. Well, let alone I, if they. I was did. gonna say like almost every character there, like if they did, if they did not save, that should that would kill all of them. Like that, which is like, why I don't, I don't like that the way of doing that. But like I'm like, hang on, like let's see real quick too. A a white dragon with. 10 d8 breath is that adult or is that ancient even that's because, adult yeah dragon of ice fire peaks i thought is an adult dragon so if they're all level four yeah that there's almost no way that's just for a them, death sentence which there's I've almost ran. no way for them to fight and it, i mean i think i think that is maybe a mechanic in dragon of ice fire peaks where the gm rolls for where the dragon might end up i don't know for certain i, I haven't played dragon of ice fire peaks in depth land up i've like I know I've played with some GMs that have like used aspects and parts of it in conjunction with some other modules, like kind of put almost like a sandbox kind of deal. So I'm not entirely sure of all the mechanics of, of Ice Spire Peak for if that's a thing that actually is supposed to happen. But either way, yeah, I mean, for sure, an adult, a, a fully grown adult dragon against a party of level, level four, four characters, there's almost no way for them to survive, let alone si vi yeah. reign victorious there. It's it's a bit um, of a, it is a, like, unfortunately, the reaction is poor, obviously. And that's that's something I wanted to point, like, his reaction is that of a child. Um, but just to be completely fair, that is a shit encounter. <laughs> mm. Like, 100% not a fun I encounter. I agree, 100%, I agree. Like, that... I don't like I again I don't know what the point of that was exactly. It was just like, oh, eh, bad luck. And 
you throw an adult dragon at them. <laughs> like, I mean, I, if it's part of the if it's part of the module, like my opinion would be maybe don't use the breath weapon. But um, I mean, it, I mean, what else then? You, you even even an attack. They have three attacks. So you just if you go down there, even a bite is gonna be what two d eight plus two d ten maybe. Yeah, it might be two d ten even. Like, let's even it's see tough, real quick. Uh, white dragon. Uh, adult white dragon bite attack is 2d10 plus six plus 1d8 cold damage and then obviously you have the claw attacks which are 2d6 plus six slashing um so it's like and then they have frightful presence on top of that too so it's like you you could potentially just wipe all of them out almost instantly I mean, hell, you would just wipe one of them out from one round. If you just focus fired all three of these attacks on one of them, they're gone. And then the next one, they're gone. And the next one, they're gone. Like, even if you, you know, switch it up, like, oh, one gets a bite, one gets a claw, another gets a claw. It's like, you're still weird... going to yeah, gonna a... take them out. Like, it's a bit just... of a weird one. But, like, I still think you shouldn't take an eight in con, but, like, that's not really the... No. That's not really the whole issue here. It's the reaction to dying. Yeah. It's like, well, again, like I said, if you're going to take an eight in con, then you should be aware you're highly likely to die. Like, they they all told him he's on borrowed time because that is the truth. It's like, yeah, you, it is almost guaranteed that you're you're going to die. It just is. Like, even even at higher levels, because you're facing stronger enemies, who again, like a dragon, for instance, even at, even if you were level seven or level eight, where like this is probably much more that that is much more of a fair level to fight an adult dragon. Like you're still again, you get hit with ten d eight ice damage, cold damage. Like and he rolls, yeah, on average like fifty two. Like let's see, what what is the average for the breath weapon here? Just here. Uh, yeah, the average the average damage for just a breath is fifty four. It's fifty four damage, just straight up. So it's like you you even at level seven or level eight, like level like whatever, like you you are if you have an eight in con, you're not gonna last long, my dude. You're just not. It's just not gonna happen. Like, uh. So yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, I I I don't know exactly what the GM did there like again yeah if they're level four not not a great I, I and i at least i hope that maybe they discussed this beforehand too maybe where you're just like hey this this module is going to be kind of deadly and dangerous just if you might end up encountering certain creatures or monsters like at lower levels so like you know you could just get killed yeah i mean that's how i've been running out of the abyss uh, yeah. uh, sparingly and that's just how it is yeah they it's... knew that we haven't had too many tough fights, but like we've had a couple that I'm like, you know, I had one where it was randomly rolled and it was, oh, you found monsters affected with the, was it Fizirness or the, the weird, like permeating mists of the Underdark that can cause uh, weird things to happen. Yeah. It causes madness. Yeah. I rolled on the madness table. I rolled on the monsters table. They fought giants. Oh, there Jesus. were only four of them. They're which, CR eight creatures. Which giants? Hill, uh, stone. I don't. They were like it. it was just I, I. think something like that. But they were CR They're probably eight creatures. stone giants. They could have done assume. like they could have done like twenty five damage. Yeah. In a hit. The problem was I rolled on the madness table, and while some of the madness table stuff is like a, a crippling issue, some is not really a problem at all. Luckily, they rolled to be very intoxicated. So they spent the first turn being confused. The rest of the turns rolling a lot of things at disadvantage and being overall sloppy. And yep. the characters won. Like, but if I had rolled one number up or two numbers down, that could have been that could have been completely hit. different. Yeah. And it's like, not, you know, it was just one of those. That's just how it goes. Yeah. You know? And that's I mean, that's, you know, that is one of the risks. And I feel like probably a similar situation happened here where he rolled dice and you know to be fair i obviously the gm is the over god of the world and the gm can decide how they want to run an encounter like that like the the white dragon doesn't necessarily have to like you know obliterate them right like it might not have any real desire to attack them necessarily depending on certain things it was like 
They're a group of small people. Why should I attack them? Like, they're not doing anything, you know. Maybe you can harry them, you know, pick on them a little bit or bully them because dragons can do that at times. But I don't necessarily know if you had to come in there literally just both barrels, fucking frost breath right out the gate to just, you know, whatever. Or if you are, give give your players a way to escape, you know, like... Yeah, I don't know. It's it, it, there's yeah, it's plenty of things one, to do. Rolling top of the initiative as a dragon, your players are normally grouped together. Yeah, breath weapon. If you get it's like a, a surprise it's a fucking, round, it's like... a fucking death sentence. That breath weapon will just outright kill a character. lot of things. I mean, to be that's kind of how it's supposed to be. It's a dragon's breath. What do you expect? It is one of the, if not maybe the most iconic like thing. Of almost any fantasy thing ever, right? I mean, it's literally a siege weapon. It can destroy yeah. like entire a, towns. A dragon's so. breath is the thing that, yeah, you, like that's what you're always the most terrified of from a dragon is when they breathe their elemental fire or whatever else, you know? Um, overall, definitely a funny, fun idea. And yeah, this this player handled everything the worst possible way they could. They were arrogant right off the cuff, completely stubborn, didn't want to like, and I don't, again, you never, why? You always not ask the question, why? Why, why didn't they want to take any advice? Why didn't, why didn't, especially if they're like kind of brand new, they didn't really understand. Like, again, they said they wanted to be a more diverse, all purpose caster. Warlock definitely ain't that. Like, that's not what a warlock is really designed for, at least previously. Um, maybe it's a little bit more that way in the new rules, but again, GM it's was not. right. Wizard or, druid or cleric would be the best diverse casters because they get the most spells like yeah. they get access to the most of them um yep funny unfortunate uh any other thoughts you have on this one sammy no that's all that's all I, right. I, yeah that's all i got let's go ahead let's move on to the next story of the day then this one's uh titled DM should have just played Payday by OK Outside 7593. Hello, using an alt account because I don't want anyone to recognize this story and find my main. With that being said, this story is from a school club. We have roughly an hour for each session. I'm already in a campaign that I'm really enjoying and with a great GM, but it's every other week. So on an off week, another person went up to me and asked if I wanted to join their game. They had co-DM'd for another person before. I've DM'd my own campaign for a year now, and I've never heard of that outside of school. Yeah, what is... Do you know what this... We're, we've heard this a lot now, and I still don't fully understand. What is co-DMing? Uh, co-DMing, as I understand it, is essentially when you have two individuals uh, or more at the table who all basically are contributing to the world, to the management, and to the everything. So to help basically evenly distribute like you know the workload or weight of one gm you know they basically i think in in most situations where that works the best you usually have like one primary gm and then you have like you know assistant gms i think is usually the best way to do that where they still help to like you know keep track of again you delegate shit to them they can't help keep track of npcs help to you know keep track of like rules or other things to help the gm so they have less to worry about I know that there are certain scenarios where you have like two people who are like equal GMs or like, yeah, we're both working all with each other to like build the world and to like, you know, do all this stuff. And like, I think either one or maybe both of them sometimes also have characters involved, which again, eh, like it can work. I've, I'm currently in a part in a, in a campaign where the GM has a player character, but they're using them kind of more so just as like a, you know, uh, to balance out the party a bit more to like give us a little bit more firepower or support, which, you know, I think that's a good way to do it. I I'm a believer. Like, I think you can have DM NPCs in the party. I think that's okay. Just again, as long as you do not take away the actual, you know, spotlight and focus on the player characters in the party, the DM NPC should always just be support, whether they're a tank or they're a healer or they're a support caster, whatever, it should always just be a means of supporting and not taking direct focus or attention from the players. Um, but that, in essence, is essentially what I believe and what I've seen or read up on of what co-DMing is. So for this, I assume, from how at least it's being presented, the dude seems to maybe have, like, 
I don't know if he was assistant GM or if he also just like helped with another or like if if he like basically, yeah, he was like one half of the GM position. I kind of get the vibe that he maybe helped the GM, that he wasn't actually the real GM, but he was more like akin to an assistant GM, if anything. Um, but OP says, naturally, I said yes. And they said the idea was that it was a heist campaign, like Payday 2. When the day came to start, I came with a dragonborn bard whose entire shtick is that she uses magic to distract her victims before stealing from them. The GM seemed to like this. And it was from there that the problems began. One player had never played, knew nothing about the game. You know, not, not, not the issue. And all the GM had them do for a character was a name and a role as apparently the role they played robbing the bank was more important than their class somehow. The other player, however, was better prepared. The GM then told us to draw our own masks. Now, I found this weird, and I told him that, well, my character has disguised self, so a mask isn't really important for them. To which I will say, like, personally, I feel like that that might not be the smartest move. Like, it, it's still probably an okay idea to wear a mask because you never know. Like, this guy's self can either sometimes be seen through or be, you know, dispelled. Or there are all there are a myriad of ways of getting around disguised self. And so it's probably not the best idea to rely solely upon it if you're wanting to, like, truly remain anonymous. Um However, continuing on, to which the GM seemed a bit anxious and told me that my sheet isn't going to be as useful in this game. But I shrugged it off as they said magic is still his thing, which I feel like right there showcases the GM <laughs> did not understand a lot of magic things and is panicking because of magic being able to probably get around a lot of the stuff he had in mind. Um, continuing on, either way, I was forced to create a mask as the GM insisted that the story revolves around four mask individuals. So I went for blank because I didn't really want to, but decided to give it a try anyway. Then the game began and the GM started, uh, and the GM started telling us a whole speech of money's nice, but that's not why you're doing this. No, see, you're here to get big, to be known, you know, and get away from a bad life. You can't stop being trouble if you don't become trouble. <laughs> now, I haven't played Payday, but I feel like it wouldn't have been out of place for it to be from there, which I have played Payday, and I'm pretty sure that there is actually a, a quote or a whole thing exactly like that. I don't know if it's word for word the same, but definitely I feel like there there is absolutely something like that. Uh, yeah, there's some definitely some comparisons. Yeah. Uh, the GM told us, you are all meeting up. Where are you meeting up? A bit of silence. No world had been described or told to us except for, it's very fantasy. One of us said, a river. Sure. The GM then asked, okay, where's your safe house going to be? We paused again for a bit. One of the players then joked that their character had a senile old grandma we could chill with, and I thought it was funny and would make for a good bit. The GM then said, All right, so after talk, after taking some time to talk, you and your party decide on opening a business next to a bank that 100% isn't the one you're going to rob. Now, the, the real clincher here is that they did actually mean 100%, and that wasn't actually a joke. The joke is that we weren't going to rob that bank that we were right next to. You know, the joke that the GM just forced all of us into. Hilarious. <laughs> I then said, well, I mean, I like the grandma idea. I thought it was kind of funny. The GM says, well, maybe some secret fifth person. Uh, spoiler alert, we were missing a player for that day. Didn't like that idea. And that was that. So we decided on a vehicle repair shop instead. And I thought uh, wagons and such, but the GM just said fantasy cars. All right, whatever. So we get to the bank to scope it out. There are three bank tellers. One that was a man who was morphed into a cheetah, whatever the fuck that means. A guy named Jeff, and then a tall third guy who just doesn't get any kind of name. 
I talked to Jeff and I pretend to be interested in uh, getting a job here. I ask if the schedules are consistent, what's the pay like, you know, yada, yada, all the good stuff. What I learned was this. Jeff was a pregnant husband that is due, or Jeff, I think, has a pregnant husband that is due in a few days. Wait, There's wait, a, wait. yeah, nope, yeah, huh? we, yeah nope, that, that already has a lot of questions already. Uh, there's a bank transfer to get more money in for tomorrow, and Jeff wants to leave when it starts as to avoid the mess. So I said, okay, cool. I explained to the party uh, my plan, which was that I was going to go in tomorrow and disguise myself as Jeff. Say, you know, I forgot something and go around to investigate the security. The GM then interjected saying, well, actually, disguise self works differently in this world. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it only works if you don't raise suspicion. Uh, also, if you're caught somewhere you shouldn't be, or, you know, you're, you're, you're seen crouching in a corner or something, it goes away. Or, you know, also, if a person is conscious within 30 feet of you, it, it won't work. So they gave this guy self basically a suspicion meter. At this point, I was getting extremely frustrated because that was total BS. And I am sure they made it up just right on the spot to stop my plan. Regardless, I said I was still going to try. Then the other players went in to talk to the third teller, the tall guy who still has no name. The brand new player didn't know how to talk in an encounter. Once again, not an issue. I thought that they still did great and were nervous the whole time. So, you know, they said they just wanted a quarter. And the teller said, what's a quarter? <laughs> and then it escalated to... You're actually banned for life now. Please leave from the teller. This was GM's words because the teller was a tiefling and the PC was a human. And they, according to him, just don't get along. So then we decide uh, just to leave, which the Cheetah Bank teller has a heart attack and then dies, causing an ambulance to just take him away. And that was all that was, apparently. It had no purpose aside from just I don't know. No purpose at all, really. Then we get back to our vehicle repair shop where, surprise, surprise, there's none other than Jeff the Teller and his pimped out fantasy car, which is bouncing on its own and playing fantasy rap on the fantasy radio. And his pregnant husband is there with him, too. I'm I guess so Jeff was on his lunch break and got in his car and headed to our shop during that undisclosed amount of time from bank to shop for some reason. And the reason why he was there, I still do not know. Because the session ended right there for me as I had to go to work. Needless to say, I do not think I'll be returning for a second session. I wonder why. Post. My <clears throat> word. <laughs> right off the bat, I will say, this seems to me like this guy, again was he said he was a co-dm for another person i would not be shocked at all to, to believe that he in fact was not a gm in any way shape or form but instead was maybe just an overly zealous or overly controlling like spotlight hog of a player who just thought that everything that the gm was doing was wrong and they wanted to do it this way and we're like you know what i'll do my own thing and this is the result I, mean, I gotta be honest, I do love fantasy radio. Like, fantasy radio sounds cool. That shit is hilarious. I fantasy love radio, it. I want, I think I want fantasy radio. Fantasy um, radio, fantasy I want, car. I want, I want fantasy uh, Walkman. That's what I want. I want a fantasy Walkman. I don't know how. I think it would be like a little capsule and you just put, you put uh, like gems in it and each gem has like a song inscribed well, onto it. I was gonna say, it. yeah, you can absolutely do, I mean, they, technically speaking, artificers have a similar thing where they can do like, they can record audio or whatever, but I was thinking like, you just have it like a tablet. Do it like how uh, Breath of the Wild, Legend of Zelda did it, where you have like literally just like a tablet that's a, a freaking smartphone, basically. It's like, a, you know, you just, yeah, that's fine, the Sheikah yeah. Slate, you know, use a Sheikah Slate kind of thing where it's just a tablet with a lot of runes on it and you like hit a rune, it's a phone, it's yeah, an one of the runes is stone. One of the runes is unfortunately a fart noise app and you yeah. can't, you don't know which one it is. Nope. Um, and you just press it every now and then and it yeah. just it just farts in your face or whatever. Like yeah. the irony of this is that there are actually hilarious, funny, interesting ways that you could have gone with this, but the GM is clearly 
exceedingly inexperienced and not just that, but exceedingly immature, has no way of and did no research at all on any of this, really, because he's literally on the spot. Like, I, I completely believe and agree with OP in that, like, GM was like, wait, you there's a spell that just allows you to take the form of somebody else. What, uh, that doesn't work here. Oof, nerf that. <laughs> like, I mean, come on, bro. Like, if you're going to run a literal RPG, basically in the world of Payday, or you want to run it, like, themed after Payday, but you're doing 5e, magic exists, all this stuff. I, just, I feel like there's better ways to do it. There's better ways to do it, my man. You could do it, and it sounds like it could be a really cool idea. But you got to be able to account for all of the magical bullshit that is present in the world. Again, this guy's self is not a super powerful spell. It's a great one. Very versatile. You love it. It's a level one spell. Awesome. You can literally, you know, but plenty of ways to see through it. It's not tangible. So if someone touches you, unless you form the form, you know, perfectly to your form, which you can do, that can help get rid of that. But if you yeah, have like a top hat or, you know, if you're, if the person is bigger than you, you have to form that person bigger than you, or yeah. you can see through it with true sight. You can see through it sometimes with like scene visibility sort of, or yeah. any kind the, of like the, the best way to use something like disguise self isn't to make you look like something completely different. It's to mask your features enough that someone wouldn't exactly you. make that your you hair look longer, add scars to your face, change your eye color, maybe slightly change your skin color. Make your clothes look newer or older. Yeah, different. You know, Make them look different. Like, but like not so different that if someone were to like haphazardly bump you in the shoulder, they're going through about an inch of disguise. Yeah. Literally have it so it's the same level as what's already there. So if they maybe spent time like touching you for a long period of time, they might notice the slight differences, but not enough maybe. at a glance and, and or at a, yeah, it at would a be hard that for they them would to really discern it that way. But use it to make something that you wouldn't even really think to look through with magic anyway. Yeah. That's what you do. You don't you make know. yourself look like a completely different person. No. And even then, it's like, you know, and even if you do do that, like, that's why you you have to be careful, right? Yeah. If you're, like, disguising yourself as, like, a really, like, fat or rotund individual who's way bigger than your normal physique, you got to be careful not to touch anybody too much with that. That, that provides extra caution and might show your behavior as being kind of suspicious. Again, plenty of ways around the spell. It's a great spell, but it's not at all infallible. Uh, same thing with like, you know, alter self, you know, alter self just changes your physical features, but not, you know, your clothes, for instance. So you could maybe turn to a more rotund individual and have actually the physical, but you don't have their clothes. You don't have anything else. So it becomes a little bit difficult and harder in that regard. Just do a little bit of research. If this guy had done literally the barest amount of research on how to run this kind of thing, probably could have been great. I still doubt it because obviously just the way he reacts, the fact that he was just like off the cuff, had nothing. He didn't even have a place for them to go. He was like, hey, you guys are meeting up. Where are you meeting up? Bitch, it's your world. You tell me. What do you mean? Like, what? Have you painted us any kind of word picture at all or a real picture? Anything? Give me a word picture. Like, oh, hey, you guys. Uh, okay, you guys met up here. Now you're going to go to your hideout. Where's your hideout? Why don't we just meet up at the hideout? What are you talking about? Like, what, what? Oh, this dude, Jeff, he has a husband who's also pregnant? Like, okay. <laughs> so are, are, is it is it like a, is it a, a is it a, an individual who was, you know, born a feminine, a female identifying or whatever, but then chose to identify as a male now, so therefore as a husband? Like, okay representation nice cool awesome uh, was 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 there a reason for that i guess like i like i don't like was it because it doesn't feel like you were doing it out of a sense of wanting to represent a, a specific demographic it felt maybe like you were just doing it to be weird and strange and just random like you were just looking kind of for like you know to get a reaction out of a random shock value or something like same thing with like the 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 teller who shape shifts into a cheetah and then just dies from a heart attack afterward. Like, why? <laughs> what does that do? Does that does that add to 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 the narrative? Does that give us like another end? Can we like pretend to be the cheetah? I 
again, why? And then Jeff shows up somehow at the same time at the vehicle repair shop with his souped up fantasy car with his pregnant husband. And they're just, and they've, it's got hydraulics as well. Like, nigga, what, what, what are we doing? What is this? What's happening right now? You just you, like, is, is this conducive to the game, to the story, to what we're trying to do? No, no, it's not. You're just doing it for shock value, clearly, which is a straight disrespectful and stupid of, of anything. You're not trying to represent anybody. You're not trying to have any kind of like intricate weaving, especially because all of the best heist anything are always ones where you actually have intelligence, right? Ocean's Eleven, The Italian Job, you know, any, 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 any shows or movies that have it, it's like you, there's a mystery or there's, there's some intricately designed, like, whoa, that's cool how they did that or how they came up with that or how they accounted for that particular variable. Having this where you're just like random bouts of randomness for no reason. You're just like, what are, what are we doing? What is this, bro? <laughs> Why? It's it's hilarious, I will say. Hilarious, super hilarious uh, post for sure. I probably would have stayed in this campaign just to see how much of an absolute train wreck cluster F it would have been just for the memes. Because I just I would just wanted to see what this guy would have come up with on the spot again. I, I would have probably, and to be fair, I would have become a that person most likely and that I would have probably been on some level deliberately trying to sabotage the campaign because I would have just, I would just start doing the most random shit. I would have just been like, okay, how do you respond to this? How, how do you, how do you fix what, this? What, what do you do about this? Yeah, yeah. what about this? What, what, if I, what about this? What if I have this spell? And I just throw that in there. Hmm? What, what, what are you going to do? Hmm? What's, uh, what's going to happen? I'm intrigued, you know, and I, I would be an asshole then, but I would, I, I'm not going to lie. I'd probably have some fun because this, to me, this seemed like a bullshit asshole thing too, where he's just kind of being a jerk in terms of like trying to like manipulate shit without being honest about stuff. And I'm like, well, if that's the case, if we're going to pull the whole, uh, actually that doesn't work here because I'm the GM and I say it doesn't because I don't have a way of dealing with that. And I'm going to be like, all right, I'll start throwing all this shit at you. Then let's see, let's see them improv skills, bucko. What you got for me? Uh, but other than that, uh, you got any ideas or thoughts on this one, Sammy? I I just like there's like so many cool ways this could have gone if that makes sense like yeah. I love the idea of like doing a heist themed campaign where maybe like to make it more cool each person like you can pick from a set of like extra perks that only exist because we're doing some homebrew stuff and like add things onto it that like make it more cool and individual but if you're just doing it just you're using 5e because you're lazy like you want to do a high skate? Like there's so many tabletop games that you could do this in. If you want it to be fantasy, literally. Theme, then if you want it to be fantasy theme, that's fine. There's no problem in using Five E as a as Just, a template. Sure. But, no. Again, the system is nice. There's also like there's also like so many other really cool tabletop games out there that will fit um, this way way better in so many ways. Like hell, even one of the top comments literally says that same thing you did. Like. Some people will do literally anything except try a different system. Like, well, no, I mean, like, because in my in my opinion, no offense, but I feel like a two d six system would work much better in a case like this. Yeah, um, something similar to a monster of the week, where it's not like that's what I was thinking, like powered by roles, the apocalypse. You like, know, like a not not set roles, not set actions. It's all it's, about how people describe what they're doing. Exactly. Like, no it's hard like a and success, fast. You, you know? know, no hard and fast rules of like skills. Well, your, character, your character can do this action or this action. It's more of like a describe what you want to do, and we'll yeah. see what happens, and we'll see how successful you are with it. Yeah. You know, and it's like. Agreed. So many ways that they could have done that better. And it's just like, honestly, though, to be fair, I don't think it would have mattered. Like, same thing. This this comment also says that, like, I honestly don't think any system would have helped this dude. Guy wanted to do a payday heist, but couldn't even get the most basic type of heist down. Or even the basics of a fantasy setting other than it just works would have played out the same either way. It's like, that's probably, honestly, again, the issue being is more so the GM rather than the system or anything else. Like, he just... He didn't do any research. If he had done the slightest bit of research or, or homework on how this works, yeah, I think it, you know, it would have been way better. He would have had maybe something. He didn't prep anything. It's like he was just like, I want to do a payday 
themed kind of thing. And it's like, okay, how are you going to do that now? You know, you got the whole process from conceptual to then theoretical to then practical application is important here. Uh, and he didn't, he also just didn't have the, the improv chops to really be able to do it off the cuff. So all around, just kind of a shit show, unfortunately, but an entertaining one, nevertheless. Uh, with that, uh, unless you have anything else you'd like to add, Sammy, uh, I do believe let's, let's move on to the next one then. Take it away, bud. All right, I got GM loved dragons and thought we should too. So back in 2015, when 5e was just getting its legs, a group of uh, a group I raided with wanted to start playing some homebrew D&D on weekends. I was thrilled for the opportunity to join them since I hadn't gotten a chance to play tabletop since I graduated high school a decade prior. Holy shit. Um, yeah, the, campaign, the campaign was fairly typical for a beginner GM. Generic people call, oh, they're playing Horde of the Dragon Queen. There it is. Uh, generic evil cult wants to revive Miss Tiamat. <laughs> we should stop them. Yep. This is until oh, but they homebrewed it. There he goes, right here, right in the first sentence. I mean, that is hey. until we met a red dragon, the red lady. She's a wall to our next objective, and she's very interested in my dragonborn wizard. Uh -oh. Now for context, I am a gay man. Clip that, and I've never <laughs> made that a secret. So I was thrown off by these advances. Still, I played along for the comedy of the scene, acting out, turning her down. She didn't accept my disinterest. She didn't accept my disinterest, but she was only a temporary character, so I was willing to tolerate the eccentricity. I was incorrect in that assumption. The ones you were pat, uh, the ones you were, what? I think a bit of a bit of a typo there. I think it's once oh, you were once, past. The, yeah. yeah, once we passed the Red Lady's Lava Tube, we had to scale the surrounding mountains to reach the temple dedicated to a white dragon. The white dragon was a lot harder to deal with on. On a plot basis, but also kept making eyes at my dragonborn. This is where I screwed up and didn't assert my boundaries. But in my mind, they were only thinly veiled innuendos. My character was quite conceited, so I thought the GM was just trying to play into that. Perhaps I sh should consider it flattering, considering most men would want to have a bunch of beautiful, powerful women throwing themselves at them. Just not me. It all accumulated in the final stretch, where we had to fly to the risen temple of Tiamat in the sky. And wouldn't you know who showed up to be our escort? Why yes, it was the red lady once again here to make an unple here to make unpleasant innuendos <laughs> about me riding on her back. I just outright refused to get on her back to the point where the session was stalled because it was too railroady to allow me to be left behind. When the other players pressed me on why I was suddenly refusing to cooperate, I just straight up said I didn't like being on the receiving end of his scaly HR violation. I am not fucking this dragon. <laughs> Things got awkward with the GM sulking about being scolded. His girlfriend stepped in and mediated for us. What the fuck? Whoa, I thought, whoa. I thought twist. Be, I know. I thought that'd be the end of it. We got to fly up to the top of the temple without incidents. However, I quickly noticed that the GM would punish me harder if I if I ever failed a check. I saw the writing on the wall, but enjoyed the players so much. I was willing to bear the passive aggression for the rest of the campaign. Fast forward two and a half years later. We were just finishing an interesting Warring Kingdoms campaign, and we're moving back to more traditional fantasy. I invited one of my IRL friends to join the group after another player was kicked out for unrelated reasons. By this point, I'd forgotten about the whole dragon mommy incident, so when he picked a dragonborn paladin, I didn't think anything of it. Surprisingly, our party does not meet in a bar. We are attacked on the railroad towards or on the road towards a major city. Skipping the hijinks. So the rogue, what? I don't know what this is supposed to say. Uh, skipping a high drink. So the rogue necromancer, sir. Yeah, uh, I don't know. He's uh, so probably, he... probably does not mean in a bar. We're attack on the road towards the city. Skipping the high drinks. Da -da -da -da. We managed Does to make it, it to the first. Yeah, let's just skip it. We managed to make it to the first town to tell the authorities about the rogue wizard hiding in the woods. That's when the busty dra dragonian uh, barmaid showed up. She sure took a liking to our paladin very quickly. Now, my friend is a great guy, but he's not much of a role player, so he mostly just ignored her. <laughs> but she did not seem dissuaded. Of course, by this point, the red flags parade had started, and I was in my buddy's DMs fuming about the last time the GM pushed his dragon shipping. My buddy's a bit of a troll, so he started to, to deliberately ignore her advances, talking around her and etc., avoiding her on return trips. The GM predict predictably began to force the issue, eventually escalating to, and you're going to love this, roll charisma checks against her... 
Paladin was a wisdom. He was rolling to seduce a player character. So our conversation, trying to get information, were peppered with poor attempts at seduction and the rolling of dice. Eventually, the GM rolls a 20. Barmaid throws herself in the paladin's lap. Now the GM and half the table are trying to joke it about it, acting like he has no choice in the matter. I'm furious, but my buddy level he- is a level-headed guy, and he just says in DMs, we should leave. In game, he just pushes the woman off, grabs my character by the arm, and promptly marches us out. I wish there was sort of a big come up into that moment for the GM, but no. We just left the game and never really spoke to that group again. I mean... <laughs> what do you think, buddy? I... <laughs> Mio, shush. I, I'm, I'm a bit, like, you know, I feel like maybe... Maybe you could have communicated just frankly. Stop trying to fuck my character. With I, I mean, I I <laughs> guess I guess they <laughs> did towards the end. Like but at the same time, like I do I do love the idea of like two people just not having a good time, being like, "All right, bye." <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I feel like this whole scenario is a bit like of an extreme reaction, like by OP as well as like it's clear that this GM like has some weird fetishy thing about dragons or dragonborn or whatever it's, and for it's strange and for some reason like just just the intensity of why he's trying to ship dragons and dragonborn or whatever it's like okay calm down like and again the issue being though too is op initially was down for it. op initially was cool and began to like kind of flirt back and do all these things and stuff and then when uh gm was trying to escalate it didn't really just shut that shit down or be like, okay, look, I, I was just kind of being flirtatious. I don't have any actual interest in this at all. Um, where it's like, okay, to be fair, I mean, the GM was still like, again, being very strange and weird, but they only made like innuendos and such. And like, he's like saying like, you know, we're just really unpleasant innuendos about me riding on her back. It's like, okay i mean you don't you don't actually have to do it though like she's no she's, you don't. she's making all these stuff and like but you know you're, you're trying to play the game right now just just fly on her back like you know i i don't understand why you're feeling so like again don't get me wrong i can understand how it would be frustrating for like a gm to kind of be ignoring your whatever but you didn't actually really you know yeah, and, and to be fair, OP does does acknowledge that they did mess up and didn't assert boundaries. And so at that point, it is kind of like, yes, yeah, like you didn't tell him to stop doing it. Like you, you, you played into it initially. And then I guess you started to not like it again for some reason, even though again, it's just a it's just a joke. It's just, you know, you're just whatever. And it's <clears throat> I feel like it could have been a similar thing where it's like people play female, you know, a male can play a female character, a female can play a male character. And they can have that character, you know, be okay with having sex or, or or engaging with the opposite gender because, you know, it's whatever. So, I mean, you don't necessarily have to have your own sexual preferences connected with your character, per se. No, but like, you also don't have to accept... You don't have to take all of the... flirtation sh- yeah, or accept the fact too. that your character might be into that at all. Like, I think there's, there's a few things to be said here. Obviously, Opie made a mistake. Yeah. Assert your fucking boundaries immediately. If you're having an issue and problem, then yeah. Like you but need you need to be honest and communicative about that. There is the reason I liked this one, realistically speaking, was that it didn't really seem that bad to me. It was funny in the sense that it's like, all right, stop trying to even to fuck a dragon. But like, I don't know. I don't feel like what, what's being said equates to how they were feeling. I mean now, obviously everyone's entitled to feel the way that they feel. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't want to be there. Sure. But sure, at no. the same time, like this seems a little bit much. <laughs> I, and that's what I mean. Like I feel, I feel like OP's reaction to this is a bit extreme in regards to what was actually happening. Now, again, one hundred percent. Like we keep saying, the GM was being overly pushy. But I assume he maybe was only doing that because he was kind of just being ignorant. Like he maybe was just caught up in his own thing. Especially if everybody else at the table was kind of like, if it was just a joke to everybody, because it kind of seems like it was. Like it seems like. It seems like uh, even the other party members, he, he brought in his friend or whatever, and it's like, oh, he's trying to set up his friend with da 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 or whatever. And, you know, it's like, 
everybody else was like, okay, this is just kind of a, you know, it's just a joke. And it's, it, it again, if you're really feeling a lot about it, which I feel like I don't, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't personally see why you have to like hate it. Like, I don't like, cause he's not, it's not like he's forcing your character necessarily to do anything. Yeah, not to this extent. I don't know. Like <sighs> he's, he's being very dismissive and that does suck. And I feel like though that, 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 what that warrants though is like, talk to him about it first though. You know, like you guys basically just dipped out, but you didn't actually have just a straight up conversation with him about it. Like that's, that's the issue that I have with this, where it's just like, you, you, you're, you're reacting in such an intense manner but you didn't actually just have a real straight up, like you, you didn't take yourself out of the games for a second. Just to like, Hey, look, I'm sorry. I'm just not really feeling comfortable with this. Like I, I'm feeling uncomfortable with this yeah, shipping. This or this thing. <laughs> like you just, you just kind of like flipped off, flipped out and were like, yo, I don't want to be on the receiving end of this scaly HR violation, which is like, I mean, that again, I, I, I again, I feel like that's an, an intense thing to be reacting to where it's like, uh, you okay. know <laughs> yeah it's like okay that, that that took a bit of a left turn especially when you you kind of played into it initially too where it's like oh or, you know uh or even then you the way you even said it is also still kind of jokey where you're not actually really expressing you know like a whatever so i mean overall like sammy said people can feel how they want to feel but and it's 100 true that this gm like was pushy way too much didn't make any sense why oh, yeah. he, he was not picking up the the clear you know cues here or there and I, honestly overall though i feel like but to be fair a lot of people are just pretty oblivious to a yeah. lot of shit too I also and so i can't i can't get my head around using a red dragon as a allied character in a horde of the dragon queen campaign seems a little strange i mean um all things you, considered there uh, are ways used, to do it like a silver dragon seven different metallic yeah. or gem dragons that exist at this point yeah. and not a chromatic one but whatever <laughs> uh you know again so i see this guy the gm sounds like a, rather, a relatively simple dude if you literally even had to have your girlfriend get involved to mediate and shit like where it's just like yeah that's a bit cringe like that's you know like, like that fun. that's that's a bit so i mean he probably should be like well i like red dragons they're my favorite you know it's like okay okay I mean, overall, I feel like everybody here was just kind of extreme. And I feel like the biggest issue was just a severe lack of just straight up front communication, I think. Uh, oh, definitely. But again, maybe he wouldn't have heard anything that you said because he still kind of did the same shit even after you had a bit of that blow up kind of argument or whatever. Like, but either way. Um <laughs> Because he also, the GM also then did some fucked up shit where he like started to punish OP harder for failed checks or whatever because he, because his whole shipping, his dragon ship didn't go through. So that's yeah, cringy. That's a pretty cringe problem there. Um, but other than that, anything else to this one, Sammy? No, that's all. All right. Let's go ahead. Let's, uh, let's finish this, uh, this bugger off, shall we? Uh, last story of the day we've got for you here is titled GM lied to me about a trigger and then it got worse by Martinimos. Uh, really quick warning, just a bit of an essay warning. Um, I've been debating whether or not to share this. It represents a really difficult time in my life and I've tried not to think about it. Still, I've been reading stories from this sub for a few weeks now and it's really helped me to know that I'm not alone. So I'll give this a shot. Fair warning, this story contains in-game adultery and attempted sexual assault. It's Ooh. also not all on the GM, as I definitely effed up more than once during this debacle. Um, so a friend of mine, I'll call him Eric, asked me to GM a homebrew campaign he designed. I turned him down, having never run a game before, but told him I'd be happy to join as a player. Also kind of weird that, yeah, your friend Eric would ask a person who's never... Uh, GM before to run a game. Start somewhere. <laughs> start somewhere. Uh, it was an online play-by-post deal with several of his friends, none of whom I'd met save Eric's wife. We designed our own characters and backstories, but Eric provided our character sheets with input and made all the roles himself without telling us the results. So it often felt like a story-centric game with minimal number crunching. Things got off to a typical start, our characters being brought together and sent off on a mission. 
Most of the players just made short posts to describe their character's actions. Uh, I put a little more flair into my post to practice my writing skills. Oh my God, they're doing a post thing instead of- Yeah, it's a post by play. Yeah, play by post. Play by post. I could never. That's, uh, I don't, how, how, how? I could uh, never. I don't, yeah. Okay, before long, I noticed that another player, I'll call her Tina, was doing the same. Since the two of us were the most engaged posters, our characters interacted a lot, sometimes positively, sometimes negatively, but it was always interesting for the two of us to play off each other. Tina and I started chatting outside of the game channels and quickly bonded over our shared interests in reading and writing speculative fiction. After a while, Eric revealed that Tina's character and mine were actually connected. Essentially, he'd unknowingly killed her mother. I wasn't super happy about this retcon as my guy's backstory had him getting discharged from the army before he could kill anyone, but I tried to roll with it. Seems a little strange too. I don't know how you'd get discharged before you had any kind of whatever, unless you had some problems. Anyway, at any rate, this seriously changed the dynamic between our characters. I should note that Tina's character could read minds, a power Tina was all too happy to abuse. That's already problematic. So her character knew exactly how awful mind felt about the revelation. As strange as it may sound, this revelation brought them closer. In fact, their interactions started feeling romantic. Okay. I'm a little interested to know how exactly Tina was able to read minds. Like, was it through like the detect thoughts spell? Because if so, okay, that's a little bit easier. But there are limitations to that spell. And if you want to use the like the more potent ability of it, it also requires a saving throw and other things too. So hmm. Anywho, uh, this was something neither Tina nor I intended. We were essentially discovery writing a shared story after all. Tina's character was always flirty, but after this, it felt like her character was genuinely into mine. I wasn't sure about it, especially since Tina and I both had spouses. But after consulting my wife, I talked to both Eric and Tina about it, and we all agreed to continue as we had been and see where things went. So we forged ahead with a romance between our characters. I know, I know. If not talking to the GM after he retconned my character's backstory wasn't my first mistake, this definitely was. I mean, not necessarily. I, I, I feel like, okay, maybe there are players out there who could make this work, but it turns out we were not those people. Okay. Uh, okay, enough preamble. Let's get this over with. The party arrives in a new city where we need to infiltrate the nobility for the MacGuffin we need. A few in-game days pass, and we're all split up to search. Tina's character is being escorted by an NPC who starts shamelessly flirting with her, and she flirts back. Now, I am not down with adultery, even in my fiction. It's the fastest way to get me to drop a novel or a show. I'd never experienced it in a tabletop game before, but I find myself having a similar reaction. This time, at least, I reach out to Eric about it. Now, I don't use the word triggered, which would probably have best described my reaction. I honestly don't have the language for it even at this point. But I do tell him that what's happening between Tina's character and the NPC is really stressing me out. In response, he tells me, and while I don't have access to the post anymore, I remember this word for word, don't worry, it's not going where you think it is. So let's put a pin in that. I took him at his word at the time. Both Eric and Tina, as well as their spouses, belonged to a certain conservative religious group. So I didn't think adultery or sexual content would be something they'd even consider for the game. Anyway, the NPC took Tina's character out for a drink, and then Eric moved that storyline to a private channel. Makes sense. He doesn't want the other players and me to have an out-of-character knowledge. Then things get really uncomfortable. My character encountered another NPC who almost immediately propositions him. When he turns her down, she then drugs him, and it's later revealed intended to SA him after she oh. dealt with something else. Jesus Christ. He must have done well enough on his saving throw that he got to his feet and escaped while she was gone. But holy shit balls, was I not ready for that? That that escalated quickly. Yeah, that got out of hand real fast. Uh so my character runs back to the party where another NPC who's hanging around with them suddenly accuses him of cheating on Tina's character. And nobody believes him about what happened. Eric tells me that my character botched his charisma role, which, fair, but it's still a lot to pile on. 
Tina's character doesn't return until the next in-game day, which then makes it pretty clear what happened. But I still don't want to believe that Eric had lied to me. Eventually, I asked Tina directly on our private channel, and she confirms that yes, her character and that character and that NPC slept together. Yeah, it went exactly where I thought it was going. Thanks a lot, Eric. <laughs> I thought that was the straw that broke my back, and I wrote Eric to let him know I was leaving the game. Her re his re uh, sorry, his reaction was, "I didn't think you'd take it so personally," which probably should have been my cue to cut off all contact. But he begged me to stay, and F me, I let him convince me. That was my second mistake, because shit just kept going downhill from there. Neither Eric nor Tina seemed to willing to just retcon the sex scene. But Eric tried to accommodate me in other ways. Kind of. He let Tina and I roleplay a new scene where our characters agreed to break up before she slept with the NPC. Which, in hindsight, dig jack shit to help. Okay. Yes, the adultery put me off, but no amount of rewriting could change that Eric had lied to me about it. Okay, I understand that. He also told me my character could have a romance with another NPC, and I agreed because I'm an effing moron. <laughs> yeah, like this why? Poor person. Why, why are you subjecting I, yourself? I mean, yeah. Well, like, like I like I when feel I. Act, bad. I mean, it's just yeah. Well, there's oh, there's a lot. Hang on. When I actually moved to pursue it, though, Eric had the NPC yell at my character because again. He botched his charisma role, which I only have Eric's word on. See, that's mm, so. You know, see, you I don't. I don't like this. Don't you don't have the GM role for it? Like that's part of the fun of the game, even to like. Okay, okay. More concerning, Eric tries to backpedal on the intentions of the NPC who drugged my character, saying she wasn't really what? going to assault him, and kept trying to get me to have him reconcile with her. Eric's wife also suddenly has her character go on a rant about mine involving some creative reinterpretation of interactions that she seemed to think were fine at the time. Meanwhile, Tina's character faces no consequences for her actions and single-handedly finds the MacGuffin without any help from the rest of the party. And I start to realize this is more than just the dice falling where they may. Well, no crap, because are you seeing where the dice fall? What do you mean? The character is, as part of his efforts to keep me around, Eric told me his plans for the future of the campaign. Apparently, all the other characters were actually incarnations of deities with no memory of their true identities. Tina's character in particular was the wife of the head deity of his setting. My guy, however? Oh, well, he's secretly a royal. And just a royal. Not only was the romance doomed from the start, the other PCs were all literal gods, while my character, who is not ruler material, gets stuck with fixing a collapsing empire. I finally left the game when I went to work a seasonal job without reliable internet access. Eric told me I could rejoin when I got back and set up my character for future adventures. My, by having him team up with the NPC who tried to SA him and another NPC who was an old friend of his, however, was retconned that she now hates him. This was when I'd finally decided I'd had enough. The trifecta of insisting on keeping the, uh, the sex scene, continuing to screw with my character's backstory, and repeatedly reintroducing this attempted R uh, or essayer told me I needed to leave. <laughs> For my own mental health, I deleted my account and blocked Eric's number when he started randomly texting me months later. I stayed in touch with Tina. We still love talking with each other, and she even participated in a superhero-themed game I ran a little while later, but the shadow of the first game still hung over us, especially since her new character was, surprise, a flirtatious mind reader. Eventually, we agreed to stop corresponding. A necessary but painful decision. I, I don't understand. So, yeah, TLDR, I told the GM I wasn't happy about something, and his response was to, one, lie to me about it, two, double down on it, three, say it's my fault for taking it so personally, and four, keep trying to lead me on until I finally walk away. I honestly wish I'd done so sooner because all I accomplished by staying was to hurt myself, upset the people around me, build negative associations into some of my favorite hobbies, and lose two close friends. End post. Uh, huh? <laughs> What's, uh, what do you make of this, Sammy? That's a weird, like, as much as I'm like, how do I put this? As much as I feel bad for this person, they kind of locked themselves into all of these issues. 
Um, yeah. Which doesn't, which... It doesn't mean that, like, they're wrong. It's just... What, buddy? Fuck, it's just not... It's just not good. I mean, it's I just mean... It's not good. It's just not good at all. I... I'm feeling just really conflicted about this because, yeah, like on the one hand, like again, I once again, I kind of feel like nobody's really innocent here. Like, right. I, because I feel like again, like OP, like, I feel like OP is having very extreme reactions, much like the other, some other OP, very extreme reactions to all the things that are happening here. Like, it's like, and it's all just really weird and interwoven and connected, especially because he's also, yes, agreeing to a lot of the stuff. Like he he is walking into and doing and 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 just like like so, so it's like okay, so it's like again, he's never really played TTRPGs before by the sounds of it, because anybody who has would never ever let the GM roll for them for everything that's happening. That in and of itself is the no. first huge red flag. Well, that's, a that's problem. the play by post is like such a weird concept to me. It's the same as like any any text based D and D that I, I just don't really understand it. Um, it's like playing Scrabble Connect or whatever with your fucking grandma. I don't. I don't. You're not actually communicating or enjoying your time. In my opinion, you're just. It's just I mean, weird. It, it, I mean, yeah, it's like, it's I'm, strange. A, I'm weird. I'm like, I use Discord and all that shit, but I'm kind of a boomer when it comes to this shit. I just don't understand. I it. mean, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't see, I don't really see the appeal of text, but like, I feel like that would be way too hard to do. Like, you have to constantly text everything out with what you're doing. And then if something well, happens, they have to text again, like to see, like, before someone else maybe texts something. Like, it's like, I don't see how this is a conducive or, or fun or efficient way to play at all. Like, it is. It makes no sense. You can, you can play online as long as you can. You can at least have audio at the very least. You don't need to do, you don't need to do video, but at the very least have audio to hear each other and to talk and speak actually cuz like this I don't get that either and then along with the fact that it's like okay you know, he's he again, OP clearly is a rather sensitive individual. And so is like basically being like, "Oh, okay, so Tina is doing all this stuff." The GM again is changing backstory to shit that he shouldn't be, which is also that's a huge red flag. That's a problem. Yeah. Like, and again, not happy about the red con. That's fair. But again, once you, well, you know, Tina and you start apparently feeling romantic, you're, you know, you're feeling kind of like, you know, weird about it at first. But then apparently you have a talk with your wife and both Eric and Tina. And, but you're fine with engaging in a romance with her now, which is like, Okay. Yeah, I know, buddy. So yeah, even even my cat is also just like, oh, hey, yeah, it's that's a already recipe for some disastrous kind of stuff here. But if if OP kind of knows this about themselves, where they're feeling particularly sensitive, especially if it's about any kind of adulterous kind of thing, I also feel like okay, but you're married and then you're engaging in this way with this person. So, but you're not feeling strange about that though. Like you talked about it. And you're over that. So you're fine with with engaging with this other person in a in a fictitious manner, right? Okay. But apparently you're getting so attached to her character now that you're taking it personally when she apparently engages in a more adulterous kind of thing now. Okay. And then, you know, you 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 did let, you know, Eric know how you were feeling about it, even though, again, it, it seems like overall you probably just shouldn't have engaged in any kind of romantic thing in general. It seemed like you're already kind of weird about that. Like, Yeah, it's very strange. And then, hell, I mean, in fact, it makes you not only, like, I think the biggest thing is maybe just your reaction. It's okay to be uncomfortable with that because, yeah, like, I would definitely be like, I would prefer my character not to engage in that kind of relationship either. Like, if, I, if two characters want to engage in a relationship with each other, then you should do that, or at the very least, if it's if you guys have like hell like in real life if your characters have identified hey we want to be exclusive do that otherwise why are you engaging with another thing if you decide to keep it more open or whatever like all right cool that's fine too but just communicate either way he then goes and like talks and he's like he says he's having a reaction that's like stressing him out and that's like even apparently triggering him which is like that 
that that is that is a very intense extreme reaction so i assume maybe because you've had you know an experience like this in your past where you've had a person cheat on you and i assume that hurt you a lot and so if that's the case like ah uh, I don't know. Like, again, and I, I completely understand, too, the fact that the GM literally said, don't worry, it's not going where you think it is. Just a straight up blatant lie. Yeah, that's a problem like that. That's effed up, especially when you communicated to him that you were having this reaction. I think, you know, obviously the best thing would have been to just be like, you know what? Let's just not have that. Like, let's let me not put myself in that position at all. You know, especially if you can see how Tina kind of is, if she's just kind of flirtatious in general, like, or if she's more free spirited, I don't know. I like, still I, I just feel, yeah, I feel very conflicted because I just, I, uh, there's just so many things. And again, to be fair, OP does acknowledge their faults, at least to a certain extent in here where they're like, I should have just left. I should have just set my boundaries. I should have just, you know, and it's like, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. and again, though, both, both. And again, though, you were, you stayed friends with Tina, even after all this stuff happened, like you let her into your other game, but then apparently you couldn't get over what happened in this game. And so you broke off your relationship with her because you couldn't let go of what happened in this game. Like, even though she didn't technically, she didn't lie to you. She just, you know, like, oh, but I couldn't forgive your your character for cheating on my character. But even though you then retconned it so that she wasn't actually cheating on your character. So what what was still the problem with you and Tina then at that point? What what was the shadow of this game? Like what again, I feel like OP, maybe you're you're holding on to a lot of shit here, which again, you know, I don't know if you've been able to seek maybe some support or help, any therapy, or if you've been able to move past it at all, but like it. I don't know. There's, there's just, there's a lot about this. That's just like, I don't, I don't I, like, I think it was best to leave for certain because that GM alone, I don't really think it was your friend. Like, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, definitely. I, I don't think like staying wasn't going to be the. No, the no, I don't, I don't, I definitely think that you just weren't the right player for this group. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that. the sexual assault stuff is is always bad. I mean, that too. That that's a huge thing where the GM is just like, I'm gonna drug you and hint at maybe a sexual assault thing. And it's like, holy shit, dude, that escalated quickly. What what why? Yeah, why? Why would you do that? What what is that? Like I honestly, after that, like, yeah, OP should have just left. Like, I, I would have straight up just been like, yeah, no, that that's not how hey, that bye. works. Yeah, that's not going to fly at all. Like, I don't, I don't know, man. It's just. Yeah. Uh, this, 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 I, like, I'm, it's, I don't even really know how to feel about this. Like, I, I, I feel like just so many conflicting aspects of this. It, it's all just like a, a strange, like, rubber band ball of just bad choices behavior mannerisms from kind of everybody involved to varying and different extents where you're just like i, <laughs> I don't yeah i don't i don't i don't really know what to say or do about this one here bud like this is just like wow in a number of ways <laughs> it's very strange to me I mean, again, I still, I respect OP for be for owning up to their own F-ups. Where they're like, you know what? I definitely effed up more than once during this debacle. Like, it's not all on the GM. And I can respect that, for sure. And, you know, because it's, it's definitely like, yeah, like, I don't really know what Tina was doing either. Like, what, what was her deal? Why, if you're engaging with this person, why then are you also starting to, like, you're going to sleep around with that dude? Like, what, what was the thought process there? What... Did you think it would create an interesting dynamic to like work on, like, you know, with, with, with OP and their character? Like what, again, I'm always back to the same question of just why, why, why do that? What are you, what are you doing? Why, what are you why? trying to accomplish? What's, what's the, what's the end game here, bucko? What are we, what are we doing, brother? What's, what's, what's the dealio? Uh, yeah, you know what? I guess uh, unless you got anything else you got you kind of want to say about this, Sammy, I think that's uh that's where we're gonna leave you guys here with that. You know, we just 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 the confusion and the the roiling of multiple maybe emotions or thoughts or ideas of like, you know what? Leave a comment down below, please. 
What do y'all think of this last one? What do you guys think of the other stories we've read? But also, I'm quite curious about this last one we've read. Like, what do you guys think is kind of like the thing here? You know, what what could have? Like, I mean, we all, we all can say all day what could have been done differently or better. But just like for me, I'm just kind of left in this place of just like I I, I just don't even know. I'm just like like huh? Yeah, literally. You know. But you know, hey. If you guys are stuck with us this long, we thank you so much. Uh, please be sure to like, you know, comment on the video. Hey, hit that uh, that notification bell so that you guys don't miss out on every, whenever we post. We post every Wednesday uh, and everything. So we hope you guys are enjoying it. Subscribe and share the channel. Uh, and with that being said, uh, we hope uh, to see you guys next time when we dive back down into the archive. Have a good day, y'all. Thanks, y'all. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs>